Hello, good evening, good day, everybody. Welcome to episode eighty-nine of Ask Abhijit. Today we are discussing Ukraine. This is the Ukraine special. As we know, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has begun about twenty-four to about forty-eight hours ago or so, and it's uh, still a work in progress. So that's what we are discussing today. So before we go into that, I would like to show you an interesting development that's happened in the United Nations. Watch this. and i may say to some it is exactly the safety of your nationals right now in ukraine that you should be the first to vote to stop the war to save your nationals in ukraine and not to think about whether you should or should not vote because of the safety of your nationals so this is the ukrainian ambassador in the united nations who is speaking to the indian ambassador and he is saying you should worry about the safety of your nationals you know what this behavior reminds me of it reminds me of a gangster this is gangster behavior it's a gangster you know you know it's it's the way a diplomat would speak he's speaking diplomatically his words have multiple meanings you can interpret in any way you want but he is essentially talking like a gangster he is saying that you know it would be a shame if something were to happen to your kids we have your kids it would be terrible it would be a shame if something were to happen to them that is what the ukrainian ambassador was saying to the indian ambassador he is issuing a public threat in a in diplomatic language that's what we are witnessing right now right so for those of you who are saying we should support ukraine we stand with ukraine and all this is the situation this is pure gangsterism it is as close a diplomat can ever come to issuing a public threat in on a public platform so that is where we stand today Ukraine and you know what's happened there are there were about 20000 indian students in ukraine because our education system is garbage so our kids have to go to other countries so about 20000 indian uh, students were there most of them may still be there and uh, they wanted to come back to india but the ukrainian uh, authorities said that if you leave then you will be suspended and you will not be allowed to come back so they were made to stay there and now they are facing this problem and i can assure you that the russian troops will never touch an indian citizen the russian troops will never harm an indian citizen and they are being very careful in the way they are proceeding there are no civilian casualties that we, that we know of if there was any civilian casualty it would be all over the western media so they are being very careful they are not hurting civilians of any nationality they are being precise and surgical in their military advance so there is no question of any civilians being hurt and yet the ukrainian ambassador is threatening india in this manner worry about the safety of your citizens this is the kind of gangsterism you're seeing and the western media will not report this so that's where we are today so uh, as uh, i mean all of you have asked lots of questions so let us with that said let's go into the questions and let's let's talk about the ukraine situ uh, situation So, what's the first question? The first question is: Before the USSR, what's the history of Russia, Ukraine, and other countries which are part of the USSR? Uh, give us some knowledge about the relationship of Russia and Ukraine in the last hundred, two hundred years. What's the point of history? What was the point in history that ruined the relationship? Okay, good question. So, listen uh, to understand the roots of the problem. Uh, we have to go beyond the last. 50 or 100 years or whatever we need to go back much further in time so let me give you a brief account of the history of this region for that let's go to the map finally i can show the map again here we are map so this is india i'm sure you are all familiar with this part of the world now let's go westwards do you know where ukraine is well here is ukraine this is russia if you can see my mouse pointer this is russia and this is ukraine here so what's the history of this place and why why did this conflict occur so that's what we want to understand so let's go back in his, in time in in time let's go back about 2000 years so the first so the ukrainians russians all these people are the slavic peoples they are they belong to the slavic ethnicity 
So the first reference in history, recorded reference in history of the Slavic people is in the first or second century AD. It's the Romans who had recorded some Slavic ethnic group or tribe or something in Eastern Europe. So they have always lived in Eastern Europe, the Slavic peoples, right? And about, so, so, so present day Russia, present day Ukraine, Belarus, etc., has been traditionally the homeland of the Slavic peoples. The Russians are the largest ethnic group among the Slavs. The Ukrainians are also Slavs, the Serbians, etc. They are all Slavs, Belarus, and so on and so forth. So about a thousand years before today, in the ninth century or so, um, the Vikings, they made their way into the Slavic world. There was this, uh, there was this leader called, I think his name was Rurik, who came and who he, to, he took over the leadership of this place, uh, of the Slavic people. So the Slavs were a polytheistic people. Uh, their chief god was Perun or per, what we call Parjanya in Sanskrit. He was a rain god, thunder god. You could, you could uh, see him like Indra, for instance. The Vikings also had, uh, the Scandinavians also had very similar uh, culture. So they were able to intermingle nicely. So these guys uh, under this guy called Rurik, they became the leaders of the Slavs for some time, even though they were Vikings. So the Slavs had Viking leadership and these Vikings, they called themselves Rus. So it is this Viking term Rus that eventually got attached to the Slavic peoples and they started call, they calling themselves the Kievan Rus. Their leader was Rurik and then it was Prince Oleg and so on and so forth. Their capital was Kiev. Okay, so Kiev was the capital of the Kievan Rus. They were the Rus, not the Ukrainians. So that is the first capital they had, the Slavic people, in their first in the ninth and tenth century, and in the eleventh century they became Christianized eventually, and so on. And this region, called which is now called Ukraine, was eventually called Novorossiya. Novorossiya means southern Russia, or, or rather new Russia. So it was mostly uninhabited for, for the longest time. And then eventually you had various kinds of peoples who made their way into this place, right? For instance, the Scythian people, uh, the Alans, uh, the Bulgars, the Mongols, the Tatars, and eventually the Russians also made, made their way in, the, in this place, into this place, into Novorossiya. In the 14th century, this place was called Little Russia. In the 17th and 18th century, the Russians, the Serbs, the Greeks, etc., they moved into this place. And that's when this place got the, uh, got the name Novorossiya. Later, it was called Ukraina, Ukraina, which means the borderlands of Russia. So as you can see, it's always been Russian territory. Now, how did the nation of Ukraine come into being, the modern nation state of Ukraine come into being? So that for that, you have to go back about 100 years. So, after the 1917 revolution in Russia, when the communists, the Bolsheviks came to power, the region that they controlled, the USSR, was created and it was divided into various administrative uh, zones or Soviet Socialist Republics, SSRs. And one of these republics, for administrative purposes, was called Ukraine. So, it is this region that we see here, right? So that, that region was created for administrative purposes and some uh, territories were added to it, which are all Russian speaking and, all, and so on. And in 1954, I believe it was Nikita Khrushchev, after the Great War, after the Second World War, he added the region called Crimea, this, this peninsula over here. He added this region for administrative purposes to Ukraine. Now the... Uh, the constitution of the USSR was such that all these various republics had the right to secede from the Union. But under, under people like Stalin and Khrushchev, etc., the control was so strong that nobody would even dare to think of seceding from Russia, from the USSR. Right. Now, uh, so, so all these regions were made part of Ukraine for administrative purposes. The eastern parts of Ukraine, the Luhansk, Donetsk uh, re regions, which is known as the Donbas region, is Russian speaking. And strangely, the Ukrainians, okay, I'll come to that later. So what happened is that after the dissolution of the USSR in 1989, Ukraine and various other republics declared their independence because Russia had very poor leadership, very weak leadership at the time. 
So uh, in the 1970s and 1980s, the economy of the USSR was not doing well because their leadership was not strong enough. And in the 1980s, it was Mikhail Gorbachev who came to power. He is, you could say, the weakest of all the leaders in the USSR. He is the one the West loves the most and the Russians hate the most because he presided over the destruction of the of this uh, country, the USSR. So Ukraine became independent in 89 or 91. Look it up which year it was. I don't remember all the exact dates. Ukraine and various other republics, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, and so on and so forth, they all became independent. Moldova, Belarus, Lithuania, Latvia, and so on. They all became independent. They all declared their independence. And the Russian leadership was not strong enough to keep them together. So they were allowed to become independent. And in the case of Ukraine, there were lots of these uh, Soviet nuclear missiles and warheads on Ukrainian territory. So what the deal that was cut for the Ukraine was that you give up all the Soviet nuclear weapons. In exchange for that, we will uh, cancel all the debt that you may have to repay. Because at that time, the USSR owed a lot of debt to various countries. So the Russian Republic said that we will take care of all the debt. You don't have to pay it, Ukraine. Just give us back all the nuclear weapons. So that was the deal. And the, the, the Ukrainians gave away the nuclear weapons to the, to the Russians. And the Russians ensured that the Ukrainians they would not have to pay any re repay any of the debt. And they also subsidized the development of Ukraine. In the last 20 years, more than 100 billion or 150 billion dollars worth of subsidy has been given by Russia to Ukraine. So uh, you had people uh, like uh, Viktor Yang Yanukovych, who was the president of Ukraine. Listen, I know there are very smart people who are watching and who will watch in the future who will say, you did not mention so-and-so leader. You did not mention so-and-so so -so president. I am giving a very brief condensed overview of history. This is not a history lesson. This is about geopolitics. I'm not going to mention every irrelevant politician who ever came to power in Ukraine. So, in uh, November 19, 2013, uh, Viktor Yanukovych was the president of Ukraine. Then there was this revolution in Ukraine, the 2014 Maidan revolution, the Euro Maidan revolution. So in February, I think 2014, the elected president of Ukraine, Viktor Yanukovych was ousted. He was thrown out and somebody else was put in place. Petro Poroshenko, I think. All right. So this was essentially a pro-EU, pro-NATO, pro-US government that was installed in, in the place of the legally elected government of Ukraine. Okay? These are facts. I am not putting any kind of spin on this. These are just hard facts. So a pro-NATO regime was installed. This is essentially nothing but a coup that the West engineered in Ukraine. Currently, currently as of today, I am not mentioning all the politicians who came to power. If you want a list of politicians, you want a dry history lesson, look it up yourself. Currently, the president is Volodymyr Zelensky. Right? He's a former actor, former comedian, whatever. Right? So, so he is in power right now. So, so let's go back to 2014 again. Once this coup happened, so now I can tell you this, that strangely enough, the Ukrainians in the past 20 years have not conducted any census. Because if, the, if they were to conduct a census, what you will find is that there is a very significant Russian-speaking population across Ukraine, mostly concentrated in the East and South, but in other parts of Ukraine also. Right. So the Ukrainian language is a Slavic language. You could call it, in some sense, a dialect of Russian, in some sense. I know lots of people will say, no, you are wrong, you are pro-Russian, blah, blah, blah. You can leave if you, if you think that way. So Ukrainian is a very, it, it's very similar to Russian. The so, so essentially, it's the same people. It's not a separate ethnicity, separate race, separate culture. It's the same culture, same people. Everything is the same. Their ancestors were the same. That sort of thing. So the Ukrainians are not willing to show how many Russian-speaking people live there. Uh, so in 2014, the after this illegal coup that was engineered by the West, a pro-Russian unrest started in Ukraine, uh, starting from, I think, February 2014. In March 2014, Mr. Putin annexed Crimea. You see this, this, this uh, peninsula over here. 
that is Crimea. It's always been Russian. It was added to Ukraine for administrative purposes by Nikita Khrushchev. And then after in Ukraine's independence, it became part of Ukraine, which was Russian territory. So Mr. Putin annexed this in uh, March, I think, 2014. And then you had the war in Donbass, in the Luhansk and Donetsk uh, regions and so on. In May 2014, there was a referendum okay, in, in this region. Uh, so this referendum, uh, I think what happened is uh, in April 2014, two independent republics were announced in the Donetsk region, the Luhansk People's Republic and the Donetsk People's Republics, Republic. In May 2014, referendums were held, the Donbas status referendums, which sought to legitimize the establishment of these republics. And the war continued, the unrest continued. In 2014, there was this terrible tragedy, this horrific tragedy. Malaysia Airlines Flight 17 was shot down. They thought it was a civilian aircraft or whatever, a, a military aircraft or whatever. It was a horrific disaster. Then in September, you, were, you had the first Minsk agreement, which was a 10, 12 point peace plan that was agreed upon. Uh, and uh, so that was in September 2014, the first Minsk agreement. In November 2014, there were general elections in the Donbas region, which elected the chief executives of the, these two republics and the parliaments of these two republics. By January 2015, the Minsk protocol had collapsed. So in February 2015, the second Minsk agreement, Minsk II, was agreed upon, which was, I think, a 13-point agreement, in which there are a couple of terms, I think point 12 or 13, uh, two, three of these, that the that both the sides interpret very differently. So again, the Minsk II agreement protocol has never been adhered to properly. And this fighting continues, the separatist uh, sentiment continues among the Russian-speaking people. In 2021, there was a significant escalation of fighting. By the end of 2021, there was a significant Russian build-up in the regions that uh, are adjacent to the Donbass region of Ukraine and various other places. And also, interestingly, in 2014, I think it is in December, Belarus changed its constitution and which effectively ended the neutral status of Belarus. Belarus is this little country here. It's also a Slavic country. It's, it was also a part of the USSR. So Belarus amended the constitution, which essentially makes it nothing but a satellite state at best of the, of the Russians. So you can say that Belarus is now willing to host Russian nuclear weapons and Russian nuclear missiles. And it will be the Russians who control it. So essentially, Belarus is, you can say now, annexed by Russia. So Belarus can be considered Russian territory from now on. So in 2021, there was this Russian buildup, end of 21, around Ukraine. Significant escalation of fighting. 2022, it continued. The escalation continued further. And the last 48 hours, we know what happened. Mr. Putin has ordered an invasion of Ukraine. Now, we don't know how far the, Ukraine, the invasion will go, whether it will be, uh, con whether Mr. Putin will be content to liberate uh, the Donbas region, the eastern regions of Ukraine, the Russian speaking, uh, Russian majority regions of Ukraine, or does he want a complete regime change and uh, removal of uh, Mr. Uh, Volodymyr? Uh, does, he, does he want to remove the current uh, president of Ukraine? So that is what we need to see. That is what we are going to see in the coming days, Mr. whether Mr. Volodymyr Zelensky will remain in power. I mean, not in power, but in his in his office, or whether he will be removed and some other uh, person will be put in place. So if that happens, it is a complete regime change. Otherwise, if the Russian incursions uh, are stopped at a certain point, then it is a liberation of certain uh, territories. And it's also interesting to note that some of the Russian uh, incursions into Ukraine, invasion essentially, have happened from the north via Belarus. That's interesting. So essentially, Belarus is now part of Russia. And we are also seeing now that the Chechen troops of the, of the Russians are now being readied. They are being prepared to come and occupy parts of Ukraine. The Chechen troops are the ones who are in the Caucasus, this region, right? This is Chechnya. There was a horrific civil war there. It was eventually controlled by Mr. Putin. It has come under control. The region is pacified. It is stabilized now. And the Chechen troops 
of of the Russian army are the most battle hardened troops. They know how to deal with everything, including insurgencies, in, including street fighting, including guerrilla warfare. They can deal with everything. They are the ones who will be put into place during in, in into Ukraine. So they will be able to deal with any insurgency that may happen in Ukraine because obviously the West is not happy with what's happening. The Americans are not happy. The NATO is not happen, uh, happy with what's happening. Uh, and they may try to foment insurgency and all after the Russian uh, takeover of the of the place. So that is where we are. And that is uh, what I can tell you about the history of this place. Right? Um, okay. Two more questions. What is the primary motive of Putin for the invasion apart from the two territories? Luhansk, Donetsk. Uh, Russia is a military power, a superpower, but a weak economy. So why should they go for war? Is it if it is because China and economic superpower supports them? Because of this, if Russia becomes an ally of China, what should India do as India's most trustable alliance is Russia rather than the US? Will this change Russia-Pakistan relationship and affect India? Okay, let's let's go into the motive. Let's, let's not take all the questions. Let's go into the motives. What is the primary motive of Mr. Putin for his invasion? See, the first thing is this illegal regime change, this completely undemocratic regime change that was, that was affected by the West in 2014, when the elected president, the elected government was ousted, right? Uh, Viktor Yanukovych's government and Petro Poroshenko was installed in his place. That is completely illegal and und undemocratic. The West talks about a rules-based or global order and democracy, democracy and liberalism. Where did all that go when they did this regime change? So, and then after this regime change happened, the new regime in Ukraine, which is a pro-West, pro-US regime, was making moves to become a part of NATO. NATO is, what is NATO? NATO during the Cold War was the uh, American anti-Russian alliance. So NATO is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. The US is part of it. I believe, uh, I'm not sure if Canada is part of it. Look it up, look it up. Okay, I'm not going to give you, I don't remember everything. But uh, France is part of it. Germany is part of it. The UK is part of it. And various other countries in Western Europe are part of NATO. It was an anti-USSR alliance. After the dissolution of the USSR, NATO for some time did not have any real meaning. It is essentially uh, the, the way of the US to control Europe, right? Because you have US troops permanently stationed in Germany, which essentially tells you that Germany is under US occupation. It's under American occupation. There's no other nice way of putting it. Imagine if you had American troops permanently stationed in, in India. What would that mean? It means India is under US occupation, nothing else. So Germany is currently under US occupation and so on and so forth, right? So, and there was this uh, deal that was uh, agreed upon after 1991, I believe, that NATO will not expand further east. That countries, nations that used to be under the uh, part of the uh, part of the Soviet bloc would not be incorporated into NATO. That was the agreement that was made between Russia and, and, and NATO. And now they are trying to break the agreement because they were trying to bring Ukraine into NATO. Ukraine, the, they changed the regime illegally, in, undemocratically. And then the new regime was making moves to join NATO. That is a red line Mr. Putin will never allow anyone to cross. That is simply unacceptable because that is the encirclement of Russia. If you, if you look at the map, if you look at the map, I don't have a map of all the US uh, military bases, but it essentially encircles Russia. Imagine if you had Russian military bases in Canada, in Mexico, in Cuba, all across the US. Would the US not see this as a declaration of war and a, comp and a, and a, and a grave threat to their national security? Obviously, they would see it that way. But if the Russians see it as a threat to national security, it, it should, it should, they should tolerate it. That's the kind of uh, attitude the US has. So obviously, Mr. Putin is not going to uh, accept that. And when the Ukrainians started making moves for joining NATO, that was the red line that, that Mr. Putin could not allow them to cross because then everything is up for grabs. So that's why, that is the primary reason. That's the primary reason why uh, Mr. Putin has decided to invade Ukraine. Uh, and uh, so, that's, so that's what it is. And also because uh, because of 
you know the media will not highlight this but the russians have been claiming that the ukrainians are committing all perpetrating all kinds of atrocities against russian speaking people there have been massacres and murders and uh, disappearances and what not okay the western media will not corroborate this so we don't know what to believe what not to believe we in india believe the english speaking media especially if they speak with a posh british accent or an american accent and they will never report all these things but i believe it may be true why should we only believe one side of the story the russians have been making the claim and actually you know it it was briefly reported some of these things were briefly reported before the, before they were all swept under the carpet they were even reported by the western media so these are the reasons why uh mr putin has gone ahead with the invasion harshit says will this war between russia and ukraine be considered to be an invasion or a first step towards building the ussr because i think this whole nato thing was really not that big just a stick with which to rush to poke russia and result into a war uh, okay so so does mr putin seek to seek to rebuild the ussr i do not agree with the with the with the perception that mr putin is trying to rebuild the ussr the ussr was a communist structure it was a communist nation state there was communism there was the collectivization and so on and so forth mr putin doesn't want to reintroduce communism into russia what he is trying to rebuild is what we would in india call akhand russia which is very different from the ussr because russia has its own distinctive culture it has orthodox christianity which is very different from western christianity right it's very very different it's very traditional russian values are very different russia is not part of the west russia is not a western nation it's more of an eastern nation it's more of at a crossroads between east and west so what mr putin is maybe uh, seeking to do is is uh, expand russia's sphere of influence bring more territories into his under his control territories which were historically part of the russian empire or part of the ussr but he's not recreating the ussr he's creating a stronger greater russia akhand russia what you could say so that essentially is what he is doing and he is trying to keep nato and the and the americans away from what he believes what russia has traditionally seen as its sole sphere of influence where nobody else is allowed to encroach so that is what he is doing can it be considered invasion of course it's an invasion you know what's funny when the russians invade the country when the russian army moves into a country it's called an invasion when the us army moves into country into a country whether it's iraq whether it's anywhere else it's called liberation it's not an invasion it's liberation we are bombing democracy into you that's what we are doing and when the and when the british army moves somewhere it's called civilization we are civilizing you all so when the west does it it is either liberation or civilization when russia does it it's an invasion this is how they portray everything when you have a russian billionaire he or she is called an oligarch when you have an american billionaire he is called a billionaire a, a business magnate a tycoon but not an oligarch what is this so that's how everything is spun around okay again harshit harshit is on a roll what was the reason behind you, russia to start their invasion from south eastern part of ukraine instead of using belarus to enter ukraine which would be closer way to cap- capture the capital kiev which leads to the fall of the whole nation are they using similar tactics to what vishnugupta chanakya said when he and chandragupta maurya made a mistake directly tar- targeting the capital instead of going in a slower way in game and capture the capital okay let's look at the map it's a good question so why did this is a this is a tactical question why did they adopt the tactics of bigger invasion from the east because in the east in the in the donbas region you already have pro russia people the majority of the population is russian speaking they are ethnic russians even ukrainians are ethnic slavs very close to russians but uh, let's let's call these people who live in the donbas ethnic russians so they were already essentially under russian control right this region it was already uh, declared uh, separate right uh, so so first of all if you invade from this region from the east from the eastern part then you will not face any resistance so you have less territory to cover 
it will it is already friendly territory it's already russian controlled territory so you start the invasion from there you want to take the easiest way into a country right but then there was a second move made from belarus as well because belarus again now is russian controlled territory so there are multiple movements happening i think even from kharkiv and all this region and other places even even from here they are moving towards kiev it looks like i think there's fighting happening right now inside kiev or on the outskirts of kiev so it, the invasion began or appeared to begin from the eastern part from the eastern region because that, that's where you have russian control already established so that's how it looked but there was also a, a simultaneous movement that happened from belarus and that's what's happening right now so it is it is a multi pronged movement that we are seeing okay what are the different ways in which a country could be brought down or surrendered like capture like catching the prime minister president in this case or taking of capital and other questions let's take the first question what are the different ways in which a country could be brought down or made to surrender so this is this is again a tactical question how do you establish control your how do you establish your supremacy your dominion your power over a country first of all you have to control all the highways you have to control all the highways you have to control the ports you have to control the entry and exit points from the country highways uh, train routes if any ports and ukraine has ports secondly you have to control all the airports so again you are controlling the entry and exit of people and other things goods material into the country then you need to cut off the internet take over all the tv stations all the internet stations all the radio broadcasting stations all of that needs to be shut down so no propaganda or no anti invasion uh, messagery messaging can be uh, broadcast and then eventually you take over all the main cities and all the local uh, legislators and all that and you capture all the all the important individuals who traditionally have been in power so that's what you do that is how you uh, take control of a country so right now what i am seeing is the russians are not going into the cities they are trying to take control of the highways and all these uh, they are uh, taking control of the airports there is fighting around airports and so on so that's what they're doing it is always going to be a systematic thing and that's how you take over a country right now i don't think they have made any move to capture the this guy uh, Volodymyr Zelensky or anybody, but uh, it may happen in the coming days. So these are the ways that that is typically how you bring down a country, like you say, or make a country surrender by taking over all the infrastructure, communications infrastructure, uh, transportation infrastructure, all the entry exit points, all the broadcasting uh, infrastructure, and eventually all the important people. You capture them. So that's how. a country is captured and the regime is changed that's how it's done akshay says how long the planning must have taken for this kind of invasion and another question and does india have okay let's not let's not go into india yet how long do you think the planning took for this kind of invasion that is a very good question once again i like the questions people are asking so back to the map the russian invasion and annexation of crimea happened in 2014 and it was a very swift move so clearly even that had been planned in advance right so if so typically you would need at least minimum 6 months to plan an invasion occupation and annexation you want to make it as quick as possible as smooth as possible you want to encounter the least possible resistance the best way of winning is to is to win without any resistance at all it should not even look like you have spent any effort that is the best way of winning without suffering any losses any casualties of of men or material so the invasion and occupation and annexation of crimea was very swift it was very smooth so clearly that was planned in advance so the planning must have happened at least i would say a couple of years before 2014 so let's say 2012 and when the planning for the annexation of crimea was happening i can assure you that the soviet uh, the, the sorry not the soviet the russian military must already have had contingency plans in place of how to take over 
parts of Ukraine if the need arises. And obviously the need arose in 2014 when the regime was changed illegally, undemocratically. So I would say that the Russians have been planning. I would imagine, I don't have, I am not privy to actual information. I am I am not privy to any actual real information. I am guessing. I'm guessing, okay? This is this is just conjecture. I am guessing that the Russians have been planning the invasion of Ukraine since 2014. Mr. Putin must have given instructions, orders to his army, to the to his generals, to his planners, strategic planners, tactical planners, to draw out detailed invasion plans of Ukraine. And all the pieces on the chessboard were slowly, step by step, systematically put in place over the time, over the years. And finally, when Mr. Putin calculated that the time is right, he has gone ahead with the invasion. And as you can see, the invasion is being executed very systematically. They are avoiding any unnecessary military action. You will see that civilians are able to stand in their windows and take videos of the fighting that's happening, which means civilians are completely safe. They are not touching civilians. They are doing what you can call surgical military strikes, airports. They're controlling the highways. Like I said, how to take over a country. They're doing precisely that. So it's very well planned and it's being executed very well. So I think it's it's been in the planning since 2014. You have to plan. You cannot just say, oh, today I feel like invading. Let's go invade. That's not how it's done. That's the short, short way of losing. Okay. Rahul says, what is Pakistan's play in all this? Uh, did, why did Imran... <laughs> Why did Imran Khan visit Moscow on the eve of the Ukrainian invasion? Are they secretly or not secretly allying? And does this also in turn aid Pakistan in annexing territories? Okay, let me explain the role of Mr. Imran Khan in all of this. Mr. Imran Khan was used as a smokescreen by Mr. Putin. So, Mr. Putin must have decided when he was going to invade, right? So he invited Mr. Imran Khan to, to, to his country one day before that. So the to, so in the eyes of the world, it will look like a foreign prime minister has come to Russia. So clearly Russia will not make any silly moves at this time when, the, when a foreign uh, head of state is visiting. Right, Mr. Putin will be busy meeting Mr. Imran Khan and, and giving him his hospitality, maybe, maybe, maybe signing agreements and all that. Obviously, invasion will not happen at that time. But what happened is that precisely when Mr. Imran Khan came, the invasion was launched. So Mr. Imran Khan's visit was used as a smokescreen to divert the rest of the world. Mr. Imran Khan was used as a diversionary tactic. And I believe the meeting between him and Mr. Putin lasted all of five minutes. It was just for the photo opportunity, nothing else. You could see, you could see Mr. Imran Khan's face. It was a very long face. It's got a long face anyway. It was even longer when you met Mr. Putin. And Mr. Putin um, said, "Welcome, Mr. Prime Minister." In, in in English, shook his shook his hands, shook his hand. They sat down for a couple of minutes, and then the photo op was over. And then it will be end of the story because Mr. Putin has more important things to take care of. There's an invasion going on. So, Mr. Imran Khan's visit was completely pointless, fruitless from his perspective. From Mr. Putin's perspective, he served a useful purpose. He's an, he's a useful idiot who was used and then discarded. Okay, There is no secret alliance happening between Russia and Pakistan. There is no annexation which will happen. None of that. So the only purpose that Mr. Imran Khan's visit served in Moscow was to camouflage the invasion. That's all it was. Aradhana says, what are the what were the factors for the Ukrainian army laying down arms and fleeing off within hours of the invasion? Are Ukrainians patriotic people and so on? And how many Ukrainian people wish to rejoin Russia? So the invasion is still proceeding. It's, it's proceeding very systematically. Uh, the, the amount of resistance that has been met has not been significant. Yes, there are some casualties on both sides. I don't know how many Ukrainians, Ukrainian soldiers may have died. Uh, the Western media is reporting that 200, 300 Russian soldiers have died. Well, that's war. If, even if it is true, that's part of warfare, right? Warfare is not all, it's not, it's not roses, it's not fun and games. It's very serious, it's deadly serious. So, I would not say that Ukrainians have completely, completely laid down their arms and fled, but the Russians are making steady progress. Uh, if they want, they can capture Ukraine in the next half an hour. They can just obliterate it 
with their bombers they are they are choosing not to do it they are proceeding very carefully they the main thing is they want to avoid all unnecessary casualties they don't want to touch a single civilian they want to do it as painlessly as possible otherwise ukraine would have been finished by now if the russians had if mr putin had ordered his heavy bombers to just blast the city of kiev it would be over within the within the first 60 minutes but that's not what he has done right so uh i am still not quite sure what is the objective does mr putin intend to take over the entirety of ukraine or is he just uh is the objective just to take over the eastern part of ukraine donbas and adjoining regions and effect a regime change in kiev so we still don't know we still don't have clarity most likely see it is a fool's errand to make predictions right as i know very well but most likely i think mr putin may not want to as of right now take over the whole of ukraine he will uh, he is doing this shock and o campaign which is which has scared the ukrainians uh, they may surrender sooner sooner or later and then the regime change will happen in kiev a, a pro russia president will be installed the way the westerners installed somebody else who was pro west and maybe that pro russian president will you will rule ukraine as a de facto russian puppet so that is also something that could be in the works so we don't know yet what the intentions are what's clear is that the eastern part of ukraine will become part of russia or it will be recognized as independent territories which are more or less under russian control so the situation is still fluid we don't have clarity yet by design when you invade when you go to war you make sure the enemy has no clarity as to what your true intentions are you have to disguise your intentions all warfare is based on deception so that's what we are seeing right now so let's see how this goes okay dhruv says if ukraine becomes a part of russia do you think how do you think the civilians will react to it would they have any say in, at all in the future will it come like another tibet you know i don't know who it is who said this the weak do what they will and, and no, sorry sorry not the weak <laughs> i got it backwards the strong do what they will and the weak must suffer as they must that's how it goes what do the ukrainian civilians have to do with this nothing how will they react to it they will have to swallow their pride and accept the new circumstances right anyway they were part of the ussr it was all mainly run by russians so it's not something that's new for them they are also not some separate culture separate ethnicity separate race or anything they are they are slavic people just like the russians it's a very similar culture the language is very similar the customs are very similar the culture is very similar so it's not going to be something significantly different there won't be a very big change for the ukrainian civilians some of them will not be happy with it some of them will say oh, well so what life goes on and so on so the ukrainian civilians will not have much of a say in any of this right democracy is a nice thing to talk about but there is no real democracy anywhere in the world even in the western countries the so called liberal democracies as we can see these days right so ukraine will not become another tibet uh, in tibet what you're seeing is complete cultural genocide tibetan culture has been stamped out the only place where tibetan culture really survives is in india in tibet you're not even allowed to children are not even allowed to study in their mother tongue they are made to study all their all their education is in chinese in india it's all in indian uh, it's all in english so we are also in in a way colonized anyway that's a different story so ukraine will not become like another tibet it will become the way ukraine was under the ussr kind of if mr putin chooses to take over the whole of ukraine or otherwise it may become the western part of ukraine may become a puppet state a satellite state of russia so that remains to be seen but the ukrainian civilians have no say in what happens none whatsoever okay two questions uh ahan says what uh, ahan says could russia try expanding more into eastern europe by attacking moldova especially since russia and moldova are in opposing sides in the transnistria dispute abhi says greetings from poland from poland taking into consideration that putin might actually capture the whole of ukraine 
what might be his next move will he dare attack the baltic countries as they used to be within the ussr or dare to attack poland as it is next to ukraine good question let's look at these countries moldova and so on uh, let's go to the map so the countries he is referring to let's go let's zoom out belarus is now under russian control whether you like it or not moldova was it's over here southwest of ukraine it was part of the ussr right and west of ukraine west of belarus you have poland and the baltic states that were referred to are estonia latvia and lithuania and this is kaliningrad which is russian territory it's a it's a russian exclave so the question is with reference to these territories what is going to happen next could russia try expanding into eastern europe which means lithuania latvia estonia poland romania moldova bulgaria and so on is is that what's going to happen and uh, what abhi is saying will mr putin attack poland i don't think mr putin has gone mad i think mr putin is a very rational person what he is doing is not craziness it's not madness it is something that has been long in the planning and he has calculated precisely how far he can go with this invasion he has calculated correctly that nato will not intervene and try to save ukraine even though they have promised the moon and the stars to ukraine and yet they have abandoned ukraine in its time of need so mr putin calculated that correctly but mr putin is not adolf hitler adolf hitler had gone mad with ambition the more territories he conquered the more his ambitions grew the more his greed grew right mr putin is unlikely to make such a mistake i do not believe mr putin will go beyond belarus and ukraine i do not think he will go into moldova yet i do not believe he will go into lithuania latvia estonia yet maybe 10 years in the future when things are significantly different he may entertain such plans i don't think it's going to happen in 2022 and i don't think he's going to make a move a military move on poland like i said the best way of fighting the best way of winning a war is to win the war without firing a single bullet that is the best way of winning a war so if you can coerce and bully a country and carry out a regime change and install a puppet regime that is pro russia then why do you need to go to war and you can engineer that over time in a few years without ever spending military might in doing that so there are multiple ways of achieving your objectives war is typically the last alternative it's the last recourse right so the nato actions pushed mr putin into a certain spot and then based on those calculations he decided to take military action but for poland for for moldova he doesn't need to take military action look at look at belarus like i said belarus is now more or less uh, under russian control did he have to send his army there to to achieve this military control uh, to achieve political control no all he had to do was make sure that the president of belarus changes the constitution which makes belarus more or less de facto a russian controlled nation right so belarus is more or less no longer a sovereign state and it's fine that's what they want so he was able to achieve that without firing a single bullet so is that not a superior way of achieving your objectives so i would say that mr putin is unlikely at least in 2022 of trying to invade putin uh, poland or any other state it would be unwise to do that he would risk getting overstretched and uh, i don't think the chinese would like that either of of this uh, behaving in such a manner and i don't think mr putin is greedy the way adolf hitler was greedy so i think it's unlikely osmita says the us has indicated it will not send troops to ukraine what options does the us have to make russians withdraw without crossing the margin of safety i'm sure the economic sanctions are anticipated by the, by the russians they must be having a plan to deal with them and saha says what are the substantial repercussions that russia can face in the coming days and how badly can they affect russia in the long run so what the americans can do is they can cut off russia's access to netflix 
to Disney Plus, to HBO, and they can uh, they can perhaps cut off Russia's access to the SWIFT banking system, and they can they have already imposed various uh, economic sanctions on Russia because currently the global economy is controlled by the U.S. But yeah, it's controlled by the U.S. There's no other way of putting it. So they can cut off various countries from the system if they wish to. So that's what they're doing. So like you said, Asmita, that uh, there are, the Mr. Putin was anti, he knew this is what's going to happen. Uh, he must have anticipated even further moves from the economic front. So that was anticipated. What options does the US have to make the Russians withdraw without crossing the margin of safety? No options. The Americans are not going to be able to make the Russians withdraw. What they could do is they could foment an Afghanistan-style insurgency in Ukraine, which will destroy the country. If they do that, let's go to the map. If the Americans do that, they will have to do it via Romania or Hungary or Slovakia or Poland. And I doubt very much if these countries want to come on the bad side of Russia. If they allow the Americans to funnel arms, ammunition, weapons, and personnel across their borders into Ukraine to create an, to create an insurgency, they're going to face adverse repercussions from the Russians. I don't think anybody wants that right now. Right. But what the Americans can do, especially if the Russians don't take over the whole of Ukraine, is they can foment some kind of insurgency in Ukraine. Insurgencies are terrible. In the 1980s, they did this in Afghanistan via Pakistan. They used the Pakistani ISI and the Pakistani government under the Aul Haq to funnel arms, ammunition, terrorists, uh, no, sorry, freedom fighters into Afghanistan, which eventually led to the defeat of the USSR in 1989 and uh, 88, 89, whatever, whichever, whichever year it was. So they could try that in Ukraine, but I don't, I'm not sure how much that will work because Ukraine is not Afghanistan. And if they do it, it's, it would be a very cynical and sad thing to do because it will destroy the country. It will cause all kinds of civilian casualties. But the Americans may do that. They may explore that option because they don't care about anyone's, any civilians as their track record proves. Okay, next. Ritesh says, does Russia's invasion of Ukraine show that whenever a big country will want, it will occupy and engulf smaller countries. What will happen to the world order then? How will the world run? This is the way the world order has always run. It's always been this way. You may be under the impression, my dear friends, that we have what the Americans call a rules-based global order. Then what are the rules? Show me the rules. Where, where do we find the written rules? There are no written rules. Whatever they say is the rules for now, right now. Next week, they will make a different set of rules. Right now, they are bombing Yemen into the dust. They are killing civilians every day. Where are the rules? Where are human rights? Right? They can invade any country they want and call it liberation. See what happened in Libya, North Africa. Do you know where Libya is? Uh, the Americans liberated Libya. See, Libya is here. Muammar Gaddafi was the ruler of Libya. Where is Libya? Here it is. North Africa. In the context of the world, here is Libya. So the Americans liberated this in the early 2010s. Was it 2010, 11, something like that, right? They liberated Libya, brought in democracy apparently. And soon after that, what you saw in Libya was open slave markets. And what happened to human rights then? Why did the Americans not stop it? You had open slave markets in Libya. And the same thing was happening in Syria when the Americans were trying to liberate Syria. Right? And the same thing was happening in, in Iraq after the Americans liberated Iraq. So when they invade, when they take over a country, it's called liberation. And then the world order remains the same. It remains fine because they are doing it. But when Russia does it, oh my goodness, the world order is unbalanced. Save the rules-based world order. What hypocrisy is this? So you know what my, my dear friend Ritesh, the world order has always been this way. 
the world order runs on the basis of geopolitics. There are no friendships or alliances in geopolitics. The only consideration in geopolitics is self-interest. I will do what I can. I will try and get away with as much as I can at the expense of everybody else. There are no friendships. There are no principles. The only principle is power and strength. If I am strong enough, I can do it. If you had asked Julius Caesar, why did you conquer? He would have given you, given you a straightforward answer. I conquer because I can. That's how the world has always run. All this world order, liberal democracy, rules-based system, it's a myth. It's just slogans. So the world will run just fine. It's always been this way. Right? I mean, look at India. The Chinese took over part of Aksai, uh, part, part of Ladakh called Aksai Chin. The, 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 the Pakistanis took over uh, POK. If you are weak, this will keep happening. It's going to keep happening. That's just the, how the way, the way the world runs. Okay, next. Aditi says, isn't it a great shame for the US? It failed to protect the country that always adored its model and was low-key in its sphere of influence. Does this indicate the rising importance in Biden-led USA? Good question, Aditi. The Americans encouraged the Ukrainians to become very strongly anti-Russia, right? They they promised the sun and the moon and the stars to the Ukrainians. And when Mr. Putin has given the order for the invasion, where are the Americans? Right? And the, the the excuse the Americans are giving is that Ukraine is not part of NATO. So we are not duty-bound or, or treaty-bound to come and save the Ukrainians. So that's why we will just watch while this happens. And that is what Mr. Putin had correctly calculated. That the Americans will abandon the Ukrainians in their time of need. Mr. Putin knew it because the Americans have a track record of abandoning everybody. Right? So, so is it a great shame for the US? Well, the US doesn't, doesn't worry about shame. <laughs> and we know what's interesting. The Americans have issued a travel advisory in which they have stated in writing that they will not evacuate American citizens from Ukraine. We will not be doing that. And look at India. India is doing everything it can. It is sending planes, Air India planes, into a war zone to bring back its citizens from this war zone. India is doing everything it can to bring back its citizens from, from Ukraine. And the Americans have said it. You can look it up online, the, the travel advisory from the US State Department. We will not bring back US citizens from Ukraine. Deal with it. You are on your own. You are abandoned. So if they don't even care about their own citizens, what do you think they will care for Ukraine? Right. So what we are witnessing right now is the beginning of the end of Western supremacy in the world. This is the visible, this, this point, 2022, the Russian invasion of Ukraine is going to go down in history as the beginning of the decline of the Western world, of the Western supremacy over the world. It, they still control the global economy. The US is still a superpower. They can still intervene anywhere in the world militarily at 60 minutes notice. They can do it but they are a declining power. We are seeing it. It's visible right now. So yes, the, it, you, you, can, you can say that it indicates the rising importance of Biden-led USA. It's all about leadership. They have lost the plot. They have. They, when was the last time the US had a strong leader? I can't think of a single strong leader in the US since Ronald Reagan. Now, 1978. No, sorry, 1980 to 88, I think. He was in power. So after Ronald Reagan, every single U.S. president has been, you know, nothing great, nothing special. And if you look at Mr. Biden right now, the less we say about him, the better. So yes, we are witnessing in real time the decline of the West. And they are going to get more and more vindictively as their power declines. We're going to see that. Soul Tunes says, as you mentioned, there, there are many countries that want to regain their old empire status, like Russia, Turkey, China, even India. That requires interference in another sovereign country. My question is, how do these countries justify their actions? And secondly, how are India's ambitions different from these other imperialist powers? India has no stated ambitions. 
you have never you will never see an indian leader an indian prime minister president defense minister or anybody ever saying that india has imperial ambitions and you have not seen you have not witnessed a single indian leader having said such a th- such a thing in the last 100 years so india has no such stated ambitions india has no imperial ambitions that needs to be reiterated show me a single instance of an indian leader saying that india wants to take over other countries you will not see that right okay now uh, the the thing there is asked over here is that many countries want to do this they have imperial ambitions which requires interference in other sovereign countries how do these countries justify the actions there is no need to justify it might is right do the america yeah you can you can talk about uh, principles and all that like the americans always say we are bringing democracy we believe in a rules based order global order when somebody is acting badly behaving badly we will go and reimpose democracy there so that is the justification or the pretext for invading countries and destroying countries right so that is the american model that you first take the moral high ground you talk about democracy you talk about liberal liberal democracy you talk about the human rights even though you are violating all the, all these things but you use the right words and then you invade so you first take the moral high ground you justify your invasion based on that moral high ground that you've taken and then you invade so the russians if you if you see mr putin's speech before he ordered the invasion he issued a justification of why he is doing this that this is all historically russian territory and you know what if you study the history of the region you will find that he was right this was historically all russian territory for centuries right so there are all kinds of justifications you can issue but at the end of the day in geopolitics might is right so you don't necessarily need to issue justifications right and there is no right or wrong in geopolitics please understand this indians have this great hang up things have to be justified you can't do certain things it's immoral unethical to do certain things that applies only to india apparently everybody else can do what they want but if india do does something it's unethical it is unjustified you know what there is no such thing as right or wrong in geopolitics if you can do it you do it that's just the way the world works look at the past 1000 years of indian history right everybody came and took whatever they wanted for 1000 years that's why india is such a broken down country that's why the economy is so small because they stole all our wealth and all that wealth that was stolen from india hundreds of trillions of dollars of worth of wealth was stolen from india it is currently in the west the west has grown at india's expense so in the future if india were hypothetically to harbor imperial ambitions who can blame india for that right i'm not saying india should do it or india has any such ambitions i'm just saying if hypothetically india were in the future to develop such ambitions who is anybody to show us the should talk about human rights and all that ethics and morality there is no ethics more morality in geopolitics as we can see okay now we come to the main thing which side should we go on as a country with ukraine or russia Taiwan, which will be important to us, is in the future in the, is supporting Ukraine. There is no reason for us to support Ukraine. Is it right to remain neutral? Uh, what should India do essentially in the situation? Will while we definitely can't get get on the bad side of Russia, being neutral doesn't seem to be an option. Why? <laughs> Why? What would be the best way for us to deal with this? See, it's very simple. Very, very, very simple. Which 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 side should India be on? is the question this is a very good question it's a very important question which side should india take in this conflict and the answer i'm going to give you is very simple india should take india's side india should do whatever it is needed to further india's national interest whatever is in our best interests we should do it so right now as you can see in the un india abstained from that vote condemning russian uh, actions 
India issued um, a set of reasons why it is abstaining. But the real deal is this, that India doesn't see any justification in opposing Russian uh, the, the Russian action. And it is better for India not to get on the bad side of Russia because we have a lot in common and we are going to have much more in common in the coming years and decades. Our national interests align significantly, right? And the Russians have a track record of being on India's side for whatever reason. They are doing it out of their own self-interest, sure. But they still have a track record of being a reliable partner. If you look look back at the last 60, 70, 80 years. And what is America's track record? They supplied Pakistan with the weaponry, with the ammunition, with the training and billions of dollars per year for decades. And they used Pakistan as a proxy to bleed India. That's what the Americans did. What happened in 2008 when the Pakistanis stormed the city of Bombay? They they held the city of Bombay hostage and they killed hundreds of people. Did the Americans impose sanctions on Pakistan? Did they bomb Pakistan? No. What happened when the Chinese did the Galwan misadventure and they killed Indian soldiers? Did the West condemn Chinese actions? Did they impose sanctions on China? Was there a vote in the UN for condemning the Chinese action? Nothing. They urged both sides to resolve the matter through talks. Please don't resort to violence. Please exercise restraint. They have never supported India. So why should India support Ukraine or the West? The Ukrainians have always voted against India in the UN. They voted to impose sanctions on India in 1998 when India did uh, conducted the nuclear tests, right? And they have been supplying the Pakistanis with weaponry and, and various uh, military material, which is used against India. And now they want India's help. <laughs> and, and now they are holding our students hostage and blackmailing India openly on the United Nations Security Council stage. Why would India support Ukraine? The sooner Mr. Putin takes over, the better for us. That will free our, our students there. So India should take India's side and it is best for India's long-term national interest to stay out of this matter. And some people are saying, some geniuses in the media are saying that India has gone back to non-alignment because India has abstained from the vote. India did not take the side of the West or of Russia. India abstained. So this is non-alignment. These people who say that are real geniuses. I, I must applaud their brilliance if they call this non-alignment. Non-alignment, which comes from the Nehruvian times, was a totally different thing. It was about hurting your national interest. What India is doing is in the pursuance of its long-term national interest. What India did right now, abstaining from voting, that is the right strategy. It is not non-alignment. It is actually non-alignment with the West. A vote to abstain is actually a vote in favor of Russia in the current situation and circumstances. What the US and the West wanted to achieve in the UN vote was to say that the, uh, that the majority of the world stands with Ukraine. If India had voted against Russia, that would add 1.3 billion votes against Russia. Then they could claim that the majority of the world is against Russia. But by abstaining, we have defeated that move. So India essentially is standing with Russia and not with the West. So that's what India is doing. Staying neutral doesn't seem to be an option. Why, bhai? We are not neutral. We are technically neutral, but we are on our own side. We are doing what is best for us in the long run. We're going to need Russia. We are going to need Russia in the long, long, long run. What do the Americans... People say that India is part of the Quad. India is part of the US-led grouping. So India should remain loyal to the Quad in the US. Why? Why, why, why? What does India get from staying loyal or, or being loyal to the US? Do we get something from the US? Do we get some special weapon systems? Do we get some transfer of technology? Do we get some uh, economic benefits? We get nothing. And look at our cooperation with Russia. We They are helping us develop 
miniaturized nuclear reactors to be used in nuclear submarines they are helping us with our nuclear submarine design they have always helped us with various other weapons and technologies they transferred the mig 21 technology to us in the 1960s we never used that that's a different story right and uh, our cooperation with them is is still very significant more than 60 70% of our weapons purchases still come from from russia why should we vote against them give me one single good reason for that right so we are not voting for them or against them we are just staying technically neutral which is something that has really infuriated the west right now and we are seeing that on social media all their disposable freelance minions are tweeting on twitter and trying to portray india's actions as as being in favor of russia so that's what we are seeing right now okay shankarjit says since russia willingly formed alliances with india's foes like china and pakistan why shouldn't india take the side of the us and 30 nato countries plus australia and new zealand in exchange for good perks okay good argument just tell me what good perk is india getting name a single good perk that india is getting from the west i'll wait i'm listening name a single good perk are we getting some weapons system are we getting any transfer of technology are they giving us nuclear uh, reactor designs for submarines are they giving us anything they're giving us nothing and russia has not entered a formal alliance with china and let alone pakistan pakistan is a nothing it's it's, it's a disposable convenient state to be used and thrown away the russians have not formed an alliance with china it's not a formal alliance yes there is systemic coordination and cooperation between russia and china and they are doing it because of their self interest they have to the americans are hell bent on destroying russia uprooting it from the foundations so they are for the sake of convenience right now temporarily cooperating with china because the economic sanctions otherwise would destroy russia the chinese are willing to finance russia fund russia so that insulates the russians to some extent from the economic sanctions and the chinese get a big strong power that is willing to act as a mercenary for them so this is a temporary situation it's not going to persist forever if russia becomes stronger the chinese will feel threatened if china becomes stronger the russians will threat will threat feel threatened do you know why let me demonstrate why look at the map look at the border how long the border is between russia and china thousands of kilometers you have a border here which is a few hundred kilometers and you have another border here very long border and this border in manchuria has historically been disputed the chinese claim large parts of the russian far east right and uh, they did sign a boundary agreement uh i think it is in the 1990s 2000s maybe i look it up i don't remember the date exactly some somewhere around that time so the boundary dispute has been settled between china and russia but from the russian perspective i i would urge you to watch my conversation with dr edward lutwak so he says that from the russian perspective the boundary dispute is not settled it is merely dormant the chinese will reopen the boundary dispute at the appropriate time so the russians know that they don't see china as a long term ally in the 1960s russia and china went to war nearly went to war there were very significant border clashes hundreds of soldiers died there was even hand to hand combat like we have these days with the chinese and the russians nearly the russians nearly nuked china and who prevented the ussr from nuking china it was the united states and that is the beginning between uh, beginning of the alliance between us and china and the americans for some reason aided and abetted the rise of china they created the biggest monster they have ever seen so that's some history so russia doesn't have an alliance with china the russians know very well that china is their biggest long term threat and that is the reason why india and russia are long term partners 
whether we call it an official alliance or not, we are allies. And the West will not help us. Tomorrow, if China invades India, the Americans are not going to help India. So, why should India take the, take the side of the US or NATO? They have never taken our side, ever. Okay. Um, was it really a good move by Russia? Or was it really necessary? And should India be a mediator in this for Ukraine? Given that in the past, during our nuclear test, they condemned us, gave T20 tanks to Pakistan, recently upgraded those tanks for Pakistan, even when India requested them not to do so. And now they are pleading with us with sugar-coated words. Russia is still way more important for us. So you have answered your question. India does not need to be a mediator. India does not need to take the side of Ukraine or the West or NATO. The Ukrainians have always been anti-India. As you have stated over here very clearly, the West has always been anti-India. Even today, they are very anti-India. This is simply using India as a pawn on the geopolitical chessboard to offset and counterbalance China to some extent. So that's the only utility that India has for the US right now. That's the only reason they are playing nice to some extent with India. If the Chinese threat goes away, they will want to destroy India as well per the Blitzer doc doctrine. The Americans have a very less known doctrine called the Blitzer Doctrine. Not the Blitzkrieg Doctrine, the Blitzer Doctrine. You will not find any reference to this anywhere. And this doctrine says that any country that can potentially in the future be a threat to the US, maybe 10, 20, 50 years down the line, that country should be crippled or destroyed. So that's what they are doing against Russia. They are trying to destroy Russia. And if India were to start rising beyond an economy of 5 trillion or so, they may do the same with India also. So India doesn't need to take the side of the West, the US, Ukraine. The question is, was it really a good move by Russia or really necessary? I think it was necessary. Otherwise, Ukraine would have become a part of NATO, which would mean that you would have American nuclear weapons right at the border with Ukraine. That is an unacceptable threat for Russia. So they, they, it was a necessary move. Was it a good move? It's been a good move. What has what repercussions has Russia faced apart from economic sanctions, which they had already anticipated? The Americans have not got involved in Ukraine. They have not come to save Ukraine. So it was a good move. Yes, well calculated move. Very well calculated calculated move. Uh, given that India has maintained continued silence on the Russian invasion of Ukraine, does India need to inv intervene diplomatically or militarily if China sets its look on? Taiwan, how should we approach that issue? Now, Taiwan is a whole different story. India officially doesn't have diplomatic relations, relations with Taiwan. India, in a way, adheres to the so-called one China policy because India is not yet strong enough to counter China. So right now, we're just, we just biding for time. India is slowly rising, growing. Let's see how quickly we can do that. In case the Chinese decide to invade Taiwan, there's not much India can do about it. India cannot do anything diplomatically. Yeah, India can protest diplomatically. India could move a resolution in the UN or support a move in the UN to condemn China's actions and so on. That India can do, yes, diplomatically. But that really amounts to nothing much. The UN is a toothless, powerless body in the true sense of the world. What can India do militarily? India can't do anything militarily against China in the defense of Taiwan because our navy isn't that big that we can have a significant presence in the so-called South China Sea or which is actually the Champa Sea the Champa Sea what should India do then if the Chinese were to invade Taiwan or God forbid capture Taiwan what should India do it's very simple many people will not like what I say what India should do is it should immediately if the Chinese make a move on Taiwan India should immediately Without losing even a minute, India should immediately secure Nepal and Sri Lanka. That's what India should do. I hope the plans have been made. India should immediately secure. You can interpret that word secure in any way you want. I'm going to use the word secure. India should immediately secure Nepal and Sri Lanka. If the Chinese make a move on Taiwan. 
that's what india should do and listen if my nepalese friends are watching i am not anti nepal i am pro nepal we are the same people i have i i am very fond of the nepalese people of the nepalese culture of all of that and india needs to protect nepal from china that's what needs to happen so if the chinese make a move on taiwan india must secure nepal and the same goes for sri lanka uh sandeep says will china take advantage of the situation to escalate tensions on the indo china border or to attack taiwan as the whole attention is currently on the russia ukraine war yes very good point sandeep uh i am not sure about whether china would want to attack taiwan right now maybe it is not yet time for them to do that the americans have a very significant presence in on taiwanese soil itself so if the chinese were to invade taiwan it would be an um, attack on america itself and the americans are treaty bound with taiwan to defend taiwan so that could become a big conflagration i don't think the chinese are ready for, ready for that yet but they can certainly escalate tensions on the india tibet border yes so india must be ready for this india must be prepared after what's happening in uh, ukraine the chinese will start upping the ante i believe it is possible it is likely that they will start creating more problems on the india tibet border chinese occupied tibet so you could see more clashes you could see more incursions by the chinese into indian territory that is something that is likely to happen in the coming days weeks months quite possible so india needs to be prepared for that and india needs to in my opinion now i think it is time now for india to enhance its military budget the world has changed the west is declining the west is not going to come to india's aid if things go south if hostilities break out with china yes we have a nuclear umbrella we have the nuclear deterrent we need to build more agni 5 nuclear missiles we need to build a few more nuclear warheads keep them ready and we need to increase the military budget it is time for that right now i'm not sure what the military budget is maybe 2% of the indian economy of the indian annual gdp i'm not sure what it is i don't have the exact figures i think it's time to double the budget india needs to do that let's see what the government decides but i think it is the world has changed now and we have to move accordingly Aman says if this war were to spiral into a global conflict or simply increase global tensions how prepared is uh, prepared is india economically and in terms of its defense will india be able to endure such a tense scenario between the world powers especially in the post covid recovery phase and chuching asks if in the future china and pakistan de- decide to invade kashmir ladakh or arunachal pradesh will india be able to defend itself without any country's help i think india is india has been preparing for a two front war for a long time india is very very well aware of what can happen a simultaneous uh, a si- simultaneous attack by china and pakistan coordinated at- attack on two flanks by pakistan in the kashmir region in the gujarat rajasthan region and the chinese from tibet and arunachal this could happen yes and i believe india has been planning for such an eventuality and there are certain red lines that the chinese will be aware of and if those red lines are crossed india can take any any action in its defense and when i mean any action we know what any action means we have the first we have the no first use nuclear policy which means that we will not use nuclear weapons first but hey words are words actions can be different so uh, i believe that india is reasonably prepared i think if the chinese or the pakistanis were to cross a certain line they would be made to pay very badly if the pakistanis cross a certain line pakistan will essentially cease to exist as a nation as a as a people and similarly for the chinese if there is a certain line they cross we have the final deterrent and i think our armed forces are our armed forces are also reasonably well prepared uh we have good infrastructure reasonably good equipment and all that so i think as of today we are reasonably well prepared for such an eventuality a two front a two a two flank war 
But like I said, I think it is now time for India to completely re-evaluate its military policy and plans. I think it is time for India to double the military budget to incorporate more nuclear missiles, nuclear warheads, and India needs a significantly more powerful navy. I am not saying build more aircraft carriers, which is which is lunacy. India doesn't need more aircraft carriers. India needs distributed lethality in the Indian Ocean. Quantity has a quality of its own. India needs numbers. When I mean when I say numbers, I mean more missiles. The strength of your navy is measured in the number of missiles you can deploy at sea on any given day in a distributed manner. If you have three big ships with uh, 300 missiles each, they can be easily taken care of. But if you have 200 ships with three missiles each, that is a whole different order of threat. That's what India needs to do. India is right now not prepared on the naval front, but we are not going to face an invasion from sea right now. We are reasonably well prepared on the land borders with China and Tibet or uh, with uh, Pakistan and Tibet. But we need to prepare further. So this is a very good question. Uh, Prithvi says, what is the best thing for India to do? Support USA and the NATO, support Russia, or stay neutral and silently take control of POK? So the first two scenarios I have ta- I have addressed. The question is, should India silently take control of POK, Pakistan occupied Kashmir? Should India do that? That would involve retaking Pakistan occupied Kashmir would involve military maneuvers. It would involve crossing the line of actual control with tanks, with soldiers, with, with the Air Force possibly. That can lead to a chain reaction. India doesn't want a chain reaction at this point. Right now, what India wants to do is to keep things under control. What India wants to do is to become a $10 trillion economy at the uh, as soon as possible. Right now, we are merely a $3 trillion economy. We have a long way to go. We cannot afford to go to war right now. Trying to take POK right now could escalate. When the shooting starts, you are no longer in control. This is one of the principles of warfare. You can make them all kinds of plans, but the moment the firing, the shooting starts, all plans go out of the window. Anything can happen. Any kind of escalation, any kind of chain reaction can happen. Right now, we don't want that. We have to wait another decade, at least. Patience, my dear friends. Patience. We will take POK. We will take it. I promise you that. But not yet. Not yet. Have some more patience. We will do it. But this is not the right time. Okay, Krishna says, looking at the situation, what is the ch- what is the chance of India trying for Akhand Bharat? Akhand Bharat, will it be in our national interest at this point in time? What will be the steps for it? Like I said, we can't even take POG right now. We can, we can take it. But it may lead to consequences that are beyond our control. Right now, the only thing we need is a larger economy. Why do I keep on talking about a $10 trillion economy? It's because your military budget is always proportional to the size of your economy. If we had a three times larger economy today, $9 trillion, then our military budget would be three times greater than what it is today. Right? So if India becomes a a $10 trillion economy, India will become a military superpower. Right now, we cannot become a military superpower because we don't have the funds. We don't have sufficient funds. We have sufficient funds to take care of our defense and impose unacceptable costs for any misadventure by China or Pakistan. But we still don't have the funds to become a genuine global level military power. We don't have it. Or or even regional level power. So, the steps, the first step for India is to become a much bigger economy. We have to industrialize. We have to grow at 10% plus every year. Anyhow, no excuses. The government needs to find ways of doing it. For the next 10, 15, maybe 20 years, 
we need to keep our profile low keep our heads down and work as hard as we can and build the economy and when the time is right we'll take back the ok and we will liberate tibet and i think beyond that let's let's not think about anything beyond that because the true the solution to pok is actually tibet the reason why the pakistanis are so gung ho and strong is because they currently have a common border with with uh, chinese occupied territories in tibet and that's why the chinese can supply them any time and that's why the chinese can even send troops to Ch- to pakistan's rescue if they want so if we cut off pakistan's access to the chinese supply lines and supply chains and soldiers and all that then we can deal with the pakistanis and pok and we can fragment pakistan in the long run so the so the real solution is to stop obsessing about pok the solution to pok lies in tibet but india is in no position of even dreaming of liberating tibet right now so we have to put ourselves in a position to be able to do that it's going to take at least 10 years so the steps for creating what you call akhand bharat is to work very hard for the next 10 20 years become a significantly larger economy minimum 10 trillion dollars and develop a proportionately large militarily military then what you call akhand bharat may be within the realm of possibility so we need patience my friends we will do it we will take back pok we will liberate tibet but this is not the right time it is going to happen within our lifetimes but not yet okay two more two three more questions uh shankarjit says if india continues to purchase the russian military machinery then going forward is there a chance that the us will impose katsa sanctions on india if that happens then what should india do between america nato and russia which side should india align with uh what is katsa you may ask so let us go into what katsa is let us um, let us google katsa what is katsa here's google c a a t s a katsa so it means countering america's adversaries through sanctions act so what it means is that if you were to purchase weapons from a country that the americans consider to be an enemy they can impose sanctions on you that's what katsa means now the americans have been threatening india for the past few years not to purchase the s400 anti missile system from the russians else we may think of imposing katsa sanctions on india right but india has gone ahead and purchased the s400 missile defense system so now in the light of the invasion of ukraine it is a possibility now that the americans may go ahead and impose these katsa sanctions on india it won't be the first time america has imposed sanctions on india america imposed sanctions on india in the aftermath of the 1998 nuclear weapons tests so it is possible now that the americans may decide to impose these katsa sanctions on india which would be an unfriendly and hostile action in which case the entire quad becomes untenable because india and the us are the two most powerful members of the quad whose other two members are japan and and australia if america imposes sanctions on india can they continue to expect cooperation from india in the indo pacific against china so so the americans may think of doing this they are already thinking of doing this i'm sure if they do it they should consider all the possibilities of what could happen after that all the repercussions do they want to do it do they not need india in the forthcoming struggle against china the indo pacific is the key to the, to america's future europe may soon be a lost case the indo pacific is the key to the future of the world of the global order and, and the americans will need india support in that so they need to think very carefully whether they want to impose sanctions on india which is a hostile action let's see how it goes but yeah it is a possibility that they may do that 
ah world war 3 so the question is will america or nato deploy their troops or give air support to taiwan and taiwan also reported nine chinese fighter jets in the zone is world war 3 coming and harshal says looking at russia acquiring ukraine so easily isn't it going to motivate big countries like china to acquire neighboring inferior countries because america now looks like a spectator spectator will this ignite world war 3 are we witnessing something that may lead to the third world war okay so the, here's how it goes history teaches us that when you have that when an existing hegemonic superpower is threatened by a new rising power in a geographical sphere of its influence then war is inevitable so when you have an established superpower which is threatened by a new rising power let's say china then once that new rising power rises beyond a certain point and when the established power declines beyond a certain point war is inevitable so this would this is called the thucydides trap i have spoken about this before the greek historian thucydides remarked about this during the course of the Pel- Pel- peloponnesian war which happened 2 and 1/2000 years before today so the americans and the chinese may be hurtling towards a thucydides trap scenario you will not see the beginning of the third world war in europe but you may see the beginning of the third world war happening in the indo pacific most likely in taiwan if the chinese make a move on taiwan the americans will have to intervene militarily and once the firing and the shooting starts anything is possible so if the third world war will happen it will happen in the in the indo pacific most likely in the taiwan region and that could lead to the third world war so most see the thing is nobody wants a war the chinese have a lot to lose they will lose all the economic progress they have uh, they have built up over the decades the americans will lose whatever they have nobody wants a war but once you take the first step of of firing the first bullet anything can happen so the place where from which the third world war could erupt is the indo pacific the taiwan region so it is a possibility i would not say the probability is zero there is a small probability that it could happen in the indo pacific region in taiwan maybe in this decade it could happen who knows let's see i hope it doesn't happen war is terrible war when you are watching war on youtube or tv it looks like something it looks like watching a movie but it's it's not fun it's it's a terrible thing it's it's tragic it causes the loss of lives and all war is bad but the history of the human species is a history of war unfortunately so yes a third world war could happen i hope it doesn't happen but if like i said earlier if somebody messes up it may happen in the indo pacific region aman says abhijit sir's admiration for authoritarian leaders is condemnable though this hurts my feelings i am very hurt when when did i express admiration for justin trudeau when did i do that i do not have any admiration for justin trudeau so this really hurts my feelings i'm no longer going to play this game i'm going home <laughs> okay with that joke we come to the end of today's session i hope i have given you all some clarity on what's happening and what could happen in the future making predictions is a fool's errand i have made some predictions let's see how it goes so in short india is doing the right thing in not getting involved officially technically in this matter india is staying neutral technically but india is pursuing its national interest understand this this is not non alignment india is strongly and vigorously pursuing its national interest and you can see this from the way the americans are so displeased and ranting on twitter so it's essentially a move in favor of russia what india has done so that's where we are today the chinese could start making moves on indian territory in in small ways in the coming days weeks months yes you could see that and possibly a big war may erupt 
in Asia, in the Indo-Pacific region, in Taiwan, if the Chinese miscalculate and make their move too early. But what we are witnessing now in real time is the slow decline of the West and the slow rise of the East. Who's going to win? We don't know. But 20 years from, from today, the Americans are going to be significantly weaker than what they are today. That is a prediction I'm making with certainty. All right, my friends. Thank you, everybody, for your wonderful questions. I really appreciate it. Do I have some questions in the live stream? I'm sure I have lots and lots and lots, but I hope I have covered everything today. So thank you, everybody. Thank you for your questions. And I will see you tomorrow in tomorrow's live stream. Until then, take care. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your viewership. Really appreciate it. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.